an article just before I, just, before, just this morning actually, as I was scrolling through, and it says, it talked about the anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic attacks that have happened in 2020. The majority of the attacks have come because people are accusing the Jewish people of spreading the COVID virus. Now that is an ancient libel, otherwise known as a blood libel. It's a, an ancient lie. When the Black Death was uh, going around, they blamed the Jews for spreading, for poisoning the wells and giving everybody the Black Death. It's not true, it's a complete lie, of course, but, but it brings about a certain persecution. I also saw another article and it showed that, um, I, th I think this was in England, but it showed that the Christian grave sites were all tagged with swastikas, but the Jewish ones were left alone. So that's an interesting uh, turn of events. But I believe that, that the Lord is, um, he's raising up a generation that is not afraid to speak the truth. Yes, we speak it in love, but that doesn't mean that the truth is always cushy and nice. He's raising up a generation that, can, that is willing to, to confront uh, with the truth of the good news. And that confrontation will bring about a, a pushback. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we will get blamed for everything and anything. Uh, it's not true. It's not based upon the truth. But it is because people, they want to shake their hands and their fists at God, and they don't want to bow the knee. That's the only thing, you realize that's the only thing that God demands is humility. To humble ourselves before the Almighty God, and to repent. All right. Well, um, I'm excited about today, although uh, normally I go through an entire congregation in one week. Uh, this week, we're going to have to split the Church of Philadelphia, community of Philadelphia, into two weeks because I got a little long-winded in my typing and my studying. Actually, the Lord kind of showed some things, and I'm going to take you on a, a journey for this, and uh, we'll just go into Revelation chapter 3. Are we ready? Is it not there? It's on uh, Dropbox. It's not on Dropbox? Okay, it's not there. That's okay. I'll do show and tell uh, and be animated in the process. That's okay. So a brief, brief background. Um, most of you know that we're, we're taking a, tr a journey through the book of Revelation. It's very exciting, of course, and we're all the way up to chapter 3. Uh, we're going uh, chapter 3, verses th 7 through 13 today. Um, but we're talking about John, the son of Zebedee, who wrote this on the, while he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. So just off the coast of, uh, on, you know, in the Aegean Sea there off of, off of Greece, the island of Patmos, off of, actually it's between Greece and Turkey these days. And, um, and he wrote this vision down that the Lord Yeshua showed him. We, last year, we talked about the congregation in Sardis, and this year, we're going into Philadelphia. We also, if you remember, each of these letters uh, has a basic structure. Uh, it starts out by saying, to the angel of the community in such and such a place. It gives a couple of descriptions of Yeshua's character and his attributes, and then goes into a praise by saying, I know such and such about you. And he praises the congregation. And then he'll go and say, but I have this against you. And then goes into a correction, something that they need to address in that congregation. And finally, he says, uh, to those who overcome, in other words, to those who take and heed the warning and do what I've said, there's a reward coming. All right, so let's give a little bit of background of Philadelphia. Um, it's always good to know the context, to know and understand what Philadelphia is. So Philadelphia, if we're going around, uh, I don't have the map behind me, so I'm going to pretend there's a big map. You've got Turkey over here, you've got Greece over here, and we have literally been going around in the cities from Ephesus and Smyrna and getting up to Pergamum and, and working our way, way down to Sardis, and now Philadelphia continues along that valley uh, down to Philadelphia. So it's about 40 kilometers southeast of Sardis and about 160 kilometers due west of Smyrna. Smyrna, if you remember, was right on uh, the mouth of the Hermes River. So due west along that Hermes River valley is 
Philadelphia, about 160 Ks. It was a strong fortress city of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was also known for a great vine growing district. So Canberra is a, you know, lots of vineyards, you know, the, the, you know, the valleys between here and Sydney, you know, it's just, it was known for growing grapes. It was also known for its textile and leather industries. So these contributed to its wealth. Uh, it was also, um, it experienced that same earthquake that we talked about for Sardis. So, you know, just, just the northeast in Sardis in, in AD 17, they had the massive earthquake that Emperor Tiberius came in and actually helped rebuild the city. Well, it was actually not just, of course, as you know, earthquakes are no discriminator based upon a specific place. So it hit that entire valley and uh, Philadelphia also was hit. And it demolished many of the buildings, leaving only the stone temple columns standing. But they repaired it. However, the people of Philadelphia seem to have um, not, uh, there seem to have been a lot of tremors. So they seem, oh, we do have it. Ha <laughs> ha, well done. Well done. So this is a picture of an open door in Philadelphia. There's not much archaeologically left of Philadelphia. Most of it is, uh, you know, absorbed into the city of Asahir. Asahir, I, I know my pronunciation of Arabic is not very good, so Asahir, Al-Sahir in, in Turkey. Uh, and so this is almost, that's basically the only ruins that are available to be seen. So there's just not much to see of Philadelphia. But the people in, in this town, there's a lot of earthquakes, and they seem to have moved to the rural areas so that they're not too close to large buildings that way, you know. And, when it, and it, there seems to have been a, a habit of people that as soon as the tremors start, you run out of the city. <coughs> so, which kind of makes sense. If for anybody, has anybody experienced an earthquake other than me? So there's several of us. It is a very disconcerting when the thing you thought didn't move starts to. Um, very disorienting. All right, let's go to the next slide. So now I learned, to, you know, I love going through these congregations and you learn a variety of incredible uh, things about the people who were there. Shortly after this letter in Revelation was written, so we believe that was around 90 uh, AD, sometime around the 90s AD, uh, shortly after that, between about 100 and 160 AD, the congregation prospered under a prophetess by the name of Amia. Uh, she, she was actually, uh, Eusebius, the historian, writes about her. He lists her along with the prophets Agabus. How many remember Agabus from Acts chapter 11? So Agabus, the daughters of Philip. If you remember, Philip had four daughters who prophesied, who were prophetesses. Uh, so uh, that's in Acts 15. And then um, all of them got together in Acts 21 uh, to prophesy to Paul, if you remember. Agabus tied his hands and, and did a prophetic demonstration, similar to this, but a prophetic demonstration to give a specific word in a public setting for Paul. And this was, this was what prophets did uh, in the New Testament. So... Uh, Eusebius writes about her and lists her with Agabus, Judas, also known as Jude, who wrote the, the, the Gospel of Jude, uh, Silas, you know, Silas who went with Paul, uh, the four daughters of Philip, and another uh, quad, Quadratus. So it's very probable that Quadratus and Amia were, um, were basically prominent after the writing of the book of Acts. So if you remember, Acts finishes uh, in about AD 65 when Paul, uh, before Paul dies. So it doesn't include Paul's death, but um, in AD 65. So she would have come around afterwards. She was like the second generation after Agabus and the daughters of Philip. And she was given high praise uh, by Eusebius in that she, her prophecy was of the order of Agabus and the daughters of Philip. So she would give words, um, you know, from the, from the Holy Spirit to believers in the context of a group meeting. So this was public prophecy. And it's interesting because Eusebius makes a distinction between, uh, between the prophecy that Agabus and, and Eusebius and Amir and these, this group gave and that style and a completely different style of prophecy where it says that people went 
Berserk's not the word that they used. What was it? It was ecstasy. They went into a, a complete ecstasy. I, it's a hard word for me to say. Ecstasy. Ecstasy. <clears throat> An ecstatic state when they went into prophecy. And there was actually a condemnation of that style or that form of, of doing prophecy that way. And so this was more of uh, waiting, hearing the Holy Spirit, and then giving a, a prophetic word uh, in a very in a, in a public setting. Now, I always lo- also like to talk about how the congregation ended. So this congregation was one of the longest standing congregations of the seven congregations that are mentioned in Revelation. Uh, it lasted until 1392, so long after Turkey had been uh, conquered by by the Turks by the um, Islamic Caliphate. Uh, this uh, Philadelphia held out with a Christian populace. As of today, uh, the last census, well, census is not the right word, the last research that was done by, uh, um, by Open Doors, I think it was Open Doors, uh, they believe that there are now only four believers total in the city of, well, Phil- what was known as Philadelphia. All right, let's go ahead and read Revelation chapter 3. 7 through 13. To the angel of Messiah's community in Philadelphia write, Thus says the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your deeds. Behold, I have set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. Because you have little power, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jewish and are not, but lie. Behold, I will cause them to come and bow down before your feet, so that they acknowledge that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never leave it. And on him I will write the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach is saying to Messiah's communities. Amen. Amen. We're only actually going to get through verses 7 and 8 today uh, in, in this. So, so we'll go into the first attributes that Yeshua actually talks about. Yeshua may, starts by mentioning that he is the Holy One, the True One. Now, these two attributes are actually only ever applied to Adonai. They are attributes of the Lord God Almighty. He is known as the Holy One to Hosea. In Hosea chapter 11, uh, it says that He is the Holy One. Adonai is the Holy One. And Yeshua is uh, also the True One. We know that Adonai is faithful and true. That will come up later. His name is Faithful and True. You'll see that as we go through Revelation. But in 2 Timothy 2.13, Rav Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, says it this way. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. That's a great passage if you want to go through that. It's very, very poignant. But what he's saying is that even when we are faithless, he cannot break faith. Now, the word faith is, is, comes from the word fidelity. Fidelity meaning faithful. You are faithful to your spouse. You are faithful to your loved ones. You are faithful to your country. You are faithful to your king. Are we faithful to God? But God remains faithful because it is part of his nature. When it says he cannot deny himself, he is faithful. What does that mean? It means that when he says something, he will do it. You can take it to the bank. He is faithful and true. As for the next part where it talks about the, he holds the key of the king of David or to the city of David. He holds this key of David. We're going to actually dig quite a bit deeper into this passage to see 
What is this talking about? Is it just talking about Jerusalem? Is it just talking about David's palace? What is this actually talking about? To, to go and understand this, we have to turn over to Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22, starting at verse 15. I know I put the scriptures up there, and you're welcome to read them up there. If, uh, if you can see from the, the way at the back, I still like reading it right in front. Isaiah 22, 15. It says, Thus says my Lord Adonai Tzavaot, Go and say to the, this steward, to see Shebna, who is over the house, what are you doing here, and who are you to be here, that you have cut out a grave for yourself, carving out a tomb on the height, chiseling a crypt for yourself in the rock? Behold, strong man, Adonai is about to hurl you headlong and seize you firmly. He will roll you up tightly and toss you like a ball into a large country. There you will die, and your glorious chariots will be the shame of your master's house. I will remove you from your post and pull you down from your station. In that day, I will summon my servant, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him in your robe and fasten your sash on him. I will give your authority into his hand so that he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will set the key of the house of David upon his shoulder. And what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I will fasten him as a peg in a firm place. He will be a throne of honor to his father's house. They will hang all the glory of his father's house on him, offspring and posterity, all the small vessels of the bowls, the, uh, from the bowls to all the jars. What on earth is this talking about? As you can see, the, the passage in Revelation is a direct quote from this passage right here in Isaiah chapter 22. He's talking to Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Well, who on earth is Shebna and Eliakim? Well, to understand that, we actually go to one of two places. The story is under the king Hezekiah. It's in Isaiah 37 and 38, or it's in 2 Kings 18 and 19. The entire story is repeated almost verbatim in both places. This story is important to God. The thing that you need to understand about Isaiah is that it is not necessarily written chronologically. In other words, they are prophecies about different things and about different places. Majority of them are future intended. But it doesn't mean that the prophecies that Isaiah wrote first are necessarily written first, although chapter 1 definitely seems to be the beginning in that that's his calling. 1 through 6 seem to be the beginning, and then it goes on from there. What I'm saying is that the, the, the occurrences that happen on, in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37 occur before this prophecy in chapter 22. This is the story, and we can go there, we could read the passages if you want, and we'll probably read a couple of verses. I'll have a couple of point verses, and you're welcome to read the whole story. But the story is of King Hezekiah. This was during the time that they, there were two nations. There was the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. It was two kingdoms at this time, and this was at the end of the nation of Israel. The king, the king, uh, let's see, uh, the Assyrian king, Shalmaneser of Assyria, comes and he exiles the northern kingdom of Israel when Hezekiah had only reigned for a couple of years. And so he exiles them and he throws the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, into exile in Assyrian cities and also Median cities. The, the, the empire of Syria included all of the Median uh, nations as well. So the Medes, how many know who the Medes are today? They're still a people group. I'm trying to remember their name. The Yazidis. Is it the Yazidis? They, they live between, uh, I'm trying to remember. They, hmm? Yeah, they live in Iraq. They live in northern Iraq. They're, oh, I know. They're the Kurds, actually. So the Kurds are actually descended from the Medes. So the Kurdish Empire, the Medes, 
joined up with the Persian Empire, which is Iran, to conquer them later, but that's many, many years later. But we're dealing with the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire obviously is modern day Syria, but it also included most of Turkey and Iraq. So all of the Kurdish Empire as well. And when they, when he threw the, the children of Israel into exile, he threw them into those cities. About six years later, uh, his son, King, the son of King Shamaneser, his son, who is more famous, otherwise known as Sennacherib, comes back down to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah. He goes through and he goes and conquers Lachish. Lachish. So there is a massive stone wall, you can go see in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, of the conquest of Lachish by uh, Sennacherib. All right. So you can actually see the entire mural of what he did. And, you know, before that time, people used to joke, oh, we have a picture of it. I don't have it up. Didn't have it up. I know. I am so sorry. We, uh, we have a nice big picture of that entire mural. I should have brought it. But until, of course, the mural was found, the Bible was a lie and Sennacherib wasn't a real person. Or Shalmaneser and Sennacherib and Lachish didn't ever happen. Of course, then they found the archaeology and oh, shock, amazing, the Bible's true historically. So he comes, goes after Lachish, he comes up to Jerusalem, surrounds Jerusalem. Uh, it wasn't him personally, he sent three people. Uh, he sent the supreme commander, the chief eunuch, and the chief cup bearer uh, to Jerusalem, and they arrived and surrounded it with a huge army. They made a statement and, and declared uh, to, um, well, the, you know, they demanded an audience with the king. So the king sent out three different people on the wall. They didn't really want to leave the city. They went up onto the wall, and the three people that they sent out were Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the royal palace, Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder to listen to the Assyrian commander's demands. So here you have Shebna and Eliakim. So the chief cupbearer was the translator of the group, and he spoke out in the Hebrew language to demand for unconditional surrender. He talked the, the, these through, and... Uh, the Hezekiah's servants, they, they beg, please speak in Aramaic instead, because uh, we understand Aramaic. Don't speak in Hebrew, because then the rest of the army is going to know what you're saying. And, he, and, the, and uh, the Assyrian uh, commander laughed at them, mocked them, and says, I want them to understand. I want them to be terrified. And so these three come back to King Hezekiah, to their master, and uh, tell King Hezekiah, what was going on. And Hezekiah was a righteous king. Righteous and unrighteous in God's terminology is whether or not you humble yourself before God or not. The first thing that King Hezekiah does is tear his clothes, puts on sackcloth and ash, and goes straight into the temple of God. He then sends these three over to Isaiah the prophet to hear what God would say. Let's, uh, I, I don't know if I have this verse up there, but this is what Isaiah said on behalf of Adonai. He says, do not be afraid of the words that you have heard, which, are, which the boys of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I am putting a spirit in him, and he will hear a rumor and return to his own country. Then I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Notice, God derides the Syrian commanders by calling them boys. Yes, God does use derision and mockery at times. This happened. This exactly thing happened. The, the entire army, they heard a rumor, they went back to Assyria. And uh, then a couple years later, or some time later, we don't know exactly how long, they they wrote a letter and says, just because we've left, don't think I've gone for good. I'm coming back and I will stamp you out. And sure enough, he came back with another army and uh, again mocked the Lord, 
God Almighty, and said, How many of these other nations have I destroyed? I have destroyed all these nations, and he lists them, and they had all their gods, and he lists them, and none of their gods were able to stop them. In fact, your God told me to come and do this. Well, okay. So, Hezekiah takes the letter, and what's he do? He does the right thing. He runs into God and puts the letter in front of, in, in the house of God, sticks the letter down and says, God, read it. See what the king of Assyria has said. See what this king of Assyria has said. Well, at the same time, of course, he also sends these three guys over to Isaiah the prophet saying, okay, what's, what's God actually saying? Back to me. All right, this scripture I have, if you put this scripture up, this is um, from Isaiah 37, verses 33 through 35. He says, he will not come into this city or shoot an arrow here or come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by that same way he will return, he will not come into this city. It is a declaration of Adonai. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, before we go to the next slide, this is really important. When God repeats himself, it's not because he's hard of hearing or forgetful. It's because we are, right? He's repeating something to emphasize it. What does he say twice? He will not come into this city. He will not even come into this city. All right? Then he follows that up with, it is the declaration of Adonai, I will defend this city for my own sake. What he's saying is, look, he's made a mockery of me. He's taunted me. I'm going to stand up for myself. Trust me, I can stand up for myself, says the Lord God Almighty. And for my servant David's sake. Because of the covenant that he had with David. The promise that he made with, to David in, in uh, I think it's 1 uh, Kings chapter 7? Or it might be 2 Kings chapter 7. I think it's First Kings chapter 7 is where that promise is. It's also in Chronicles. But it's this covenant that he makes to David that you will always have a seed on the throne. So he says, because of this covenant and because of my own, the honor of my name, my own name's sake, I will personally defend this city to save it. So why do I bring this up? This seems like such a huge rabbit trail that we've gone away from, from the you know, revelation. We're talking about this story about Hezekiah. Well, this next verse, let's put up the next verse, is so important. The very next verse, it says, That night it came about that the angel of Adonai went out and struck down 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. Now, we've talked a little bit in the congregation about this mysterious character. That God has angels. He, he sends them out there. The generic, like we know about my, what, and their name of Michael and Gabriel. These are just messengers. The word angel literally means messenger. So, uh, you know, they are divine messengers. But there's this one interesting angel that is called the angel of Adonai. It's given the, that direct object, Yeah. It's the angel, not an angel. It's the angel of Adonai. And this interesting character shows up a lot. And sometimes he's called Adonai. He's not just called the angel of Adonai. He's called Adonai. So much so that the Jewish uh, rabbis, they, they didn't know what to do with him. So they call him Metatron, which sounds very much to me like the Transformers. But um, they call him Metatron. And they say that he goes around and he is called by the name of Adonai. Now, I disagree with that interpretation. I have a different interpretation. I think that this is a pre-incarnate Yeshua. Okay? Why do I say that? Well, first of all, Adonai says that I will personally defend. I will defend this city. Now, as a king, that sh surely could mean that, you know, he sends his representative to do so. But then he sends this interesting angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. By the way, this, the, this angel of the Lord showed up to Gideon's parents as well. You can go read about that. And they offered and worshipped to him. And Gideon's and Samson's parents as well. Gideon, 
No, oh, showed up to Gideon, showed up to Samson's parents. That's right, thank you. Showed up to another guy by the name of Yeshua. I mean, Joshua. Yahushua. Joshua. It says, who have you come? No, I am the angel of the Lord. You notice that it only took him, one angel, the angel of the Lord. He revealed himself and he took personal responsibility for protecting Jerusalem and the city of David. Adonai had stated that he controls who comes in and who goes out. This is jumping back to that Isaiah 22, that prophecy that had been given. He says, I'm going to give to Eliakim the keys of the city of David. God is the one who says, listen, I determine if he's going to come in, if King Sennacherib's going to come in. He's not even going to come in. I'm not even going to let him through the door. I hold the keys. This entire story, like I said, is repeated in 2 Kings. Now, it's not, again, because we are short, you know, that it's not because he's hard of hearing or he forgot that there were two people writing it. No, it's because it was very important. Now let's go back to Revelation. Back to Revelation. This is the key, this key that is spoken of. I'll read the first two verses again. So verse 7 and 8. To the angel of Messiah's community in Philadelphia write, Thus says the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. Yeshua is the one who has the key. He is the one who has the key of David. He is the one who decides who can come in to the kingdom of God and who does not. Yeshua gave many examples of this. He talked about how he is the door, the doorway. He talked about how he is the gatekeeper, the shepherd, the shepherd who watches the sheep, who separates sheep from goats. The, the shepherd would literally lie down at the gate and would determine who came in and who stayed out. You see, Yeshua many times made reference of this. He said he is the one who has the keys to hell and death. You see, Yeshua holds the keys. He holds the authority. He is the one who allows access into the royal palace or denies access. This would have been extremely important to those who were in Philadelphia. Those in Philadelphia experienced a huge amount of persecution. They were kicked out of the synagogue, just like the blind man who was healed by Yeshua was kicked out of the synagogue because he claimed that Yeshua was Messiah. This was very normal. You see it happening in the book of Acts. Yeshua even warned of it. He said, you will be thrown out of the synagogue. I've been thrown out of the synagogue. It's not fun. It's not fun. You feel rejected. You feel belittled. You, you don't understand what's going on. Your entire world is turned upside down. And they had been denied access to the Word of God. Well, wait a second. Who is the living Word of God? And what Yeshua is saying is, I know that they have denied you access to the synagogue, but I'm the one who really denies access. And I'm the one who allows access. And I have allowed access for you. This would have been so encouraging, simply knowing that Yeshua is the one who holds the key of David. He is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings. He is the one who can protect us from persecution or sustain us through persecution. Either way, our lives are fully in his hands. Yes, Elizabeth? Yes. Knocks on the door. So she's remembering the story of Pilgrim's Progress. And you go up to the wicket gate and says it says, knock on the door. And then that was the big question. Who came in by the door or those who jumped over the fence? We have to come through the door. The door is Yeshua. 
He holds the keys to the entrance to the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm in, in terms of applying this to us today, let's go to the next one. Let's see. Actually, I skipped over that one, so let's go to the next one after that. There we go. That's good. In terms of applying this to us today, this passage of the, the letter to Philadelphia is very personal to me. Um, about, uh, I guess it's now 10, almost 11 years ago, I would guess, uh, about, about 11 years ago, now that it's the new year, uh, I was happy working as an engineer. I was an aerospace engineer working for a company, doing very well, doing uh, some great work. And, um, and you know, uh, it just uh, I was sitting at my desk, but I just really had this, you know, we, we'd been praying about these things and we'd been having these, I'd had these recurring dreams about uh, basically getting out of the city. We lived in San Antonio, Texas. Get out of the city uh, because persecution was coming. Uh, in the dreams were things like riots, things like um, uh, arrests and persecution, being thrown in jail, and escaping from from a uh, a government gone rogue, basically, and persecution because religious persecution. So I was seeking God and saying, "What God are you talking about?" We were looking for a house outside of the city. We thought that's what the Lord was trying to say. So we were looking around San Antonio for a house outside the city, and. Um, we were at a, a, um, a prayer meeting uh, or a Bible study, a small house group, and uh, we split up at the end, in, uh, men and women, and just a little time of personal prayer. And the leader said, he says, listen, I know that you've been talking about and praying about uh, moving outside the city, but he says, I just got this vision or really just a picture in my mind. I was wondering if I could share it. And so he, what he shared, he says, I see you guys in your house and you are outside the city. And you're having a Bible study in your home. But he said the strangest thing is that the city is not in America. And he says, I don't know. I don't know what that means. He says, have you guys ever considered moving to Israel? And we said, no, <laughs> not at all. We had no desire to leave the United States whatsoever. I still love the U.S. And it's still very, very dear to my heart. But... Uh, it, it caused me to go back to the Lord, to fast and pray and say, God, what are you saying? I said, God, you're going to have to give me more than just dreams and visions, which I know that sounds, that might sound a little you know, presumptuous, but I said, God, you're going to have to give me more than dreams and visions if you want me to move my family out of America and halfway around the world. And so I was listening to the scripture. I was, you know, streaming the scripture and uh I was praying and fasting. And I sat down on my desk and I put my headphones in to do my engineering. I'm one of those people that can do engineering while listening to scripture or listening to music. It just, it helps me focus. It's a, I know it's strange, but it was at that place in Revelation chapter 3, this passage right here, the church of Philadelphia, where Yeshua says, I have set before you an open door. When I open a door, no one can shut it. When I shut a door, no one can open it. And there's a lot more in here. He says, I, he says I'll, I, you know, take those who say that they are Jewish but are not, but lie, and I'll cause them to come and bow down your, at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And I sat there at my desk and I said, okay, God, that's enough. I choose to open my heart. If you open the door, I'll go through it. And so that day I submitted my resume to Israeli, Israeli Aircraft Industries. Uh, I applied for a job. My my rabbi had worked for them before, and so he had connections, and I applied. Well, six months went by. Six months went by, and nothing happened. And I went back to the Lord. I said, I thought you said it was an open door. This doesn't seem like an open door. I might be slow, but this doesn't seem like an open door. And so Ellie, my wife, says, well, what about Australia? And I reacted in, in a very strong way. I says, I don't want to move to Australia. They're socialists there. I have repented for my initial reaction. Um, when, an, when an American says socialist, they mean communist, and I apologize for that, uh, or on the way to communism. But I, uh, I repented because Ellie then turned back around and says, but I thought that you said that if God opened the door, you would walk through it whatever door that was. So I repented. I said, okay, Lord, 
I will send a letter to the embassy to find out. And by that time, I was actually working from home and, um, and I talked to the, my then manager and I said, is it possible for me to work from another country? He says, sure, that's fine as long as you get work done. We already had, he already had several people working out of the country and it wasn't an issue. We talked to the Australian embassy and they flung the doors wide open. They gave all of our kids dual citizenship. I, I still had my, dual, my Australian citizenship, which I didn't realize. Um, I thought that it had, I'd lost it when I became an American. And uh, then they gave my wife a partner visa. I mean, put her on the path for the partner visa. And so we came here, a lot of the reason why we were even willing to go to Australia was because of this passage. This passage made us realize that we would be here, that we would be doing some sort of Jewish ministry. We were at the time a part of Messianic congregation. Ellie was teaching Hebrew. I was heading up the house group, uh, home groups at that, at that congregation. And so we, taught, we, um, we realized this. We were still not 100% sure, but we told all of our prayer partners. And we said, pray for us. This is what we feel God is saying. And a, a, a young lady, uh, Rella Shipman, uh, she's a woman of faith. She's passed away since, um, not, not, not so young, but um, she, is a, she is a true apostle. Uh, she uh, basically, she's the missionary that went to all the countries that blonde-haired, blue-eyed ladies uh, are not advised to go to alone. She was a missionary in Iraq during the Iraq war. She was a missionary in Egypt. She started and planted multiple, multiple uh, schools, like Bible schools, Bible colleges, raising up uh, leaders to pastor congregations in Egypt. She was a missionary in Jordan and had the ear of some of the most powerful people in Jordan, both in the media and in the government. Uh, she was a woman of faith. Uh, she was... Uh, until her 40s, when she accepted Yeshua, she was an alcoholic and an unbeliever, and God grabbed a hold of her, uh, literally slapped her on the, her bed, stood at the end of her bed and says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And so she, the Lord grabbed a hold of her from there and took her to these places and used her mightily. She had an insight into the spiritual realm that was born out of literal experience living with God, seeing God move. Uh, when, she, when we told her this, she says, this is so exciting. She says, God has been showing me this, and I didn't know how to tell you guys because I didn't know how you would respond. This is exactly what God has been showing me. And several, several of the other prayer partners that we mentioned or that we had, uh, even a gentleman, uh, Ezra Yavi in, um, in San Antonio, he just, you know, prophetic words, are confirming that this is the direction that we were to go. We've written these things down and we've stored these things and these things have held us through the difficult times. But I said, yes, Lord, we'll go. I turned, we, we looked for a Messianic congregation in Canberra. Canberra was our only option for us. I had a brother and sister who lived here and um, in Canberra. And so people asked, why Canberra? Well, we had family here. We knew we were coming to Australia, so we, we said Canberra is it. And uh, if I'm going to go to Australia, I'm going to go to a place where family is. And um, God didn't say no to that. And uh, when I, I actually contacted Celebrate Messiah, uh, Mark Plonsky, he, he doesn't remember it. I sent him an email and said, hey, are there any Messianic congregations in Canberra? And he says, well, not really congregations. Um, there's not really any congregations. Uh, there's believers there, but there's not really you know, and there's other churches, of course, but there's not really congregation. And so uh, I turned to Rabbi Roy and uh, said to him, I said, I guess we'll start something. We'll start in our home. I know how to do that. We'll start something in our home and we'll go from there. Rabbi Roy was so excited. You know, God puts us on paths. He is the most, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this with a tongue in cheek, he's the most church plantingist messianic rabbi that I have ever met in my life. I think he's personally responsible for at least four or five different congregations, raising up leaders and pour, pouring them out. And there are so many others that have been inspired by him. 
And it's just, it was just, you know, the Lord, he knew exactly what to do. I didn't know what to do. He says, that's great. Good. We're going to set you guys in as elders. We're going to get you on the part for ordination. This is what you're going to do. You're going to preach every, about every month. And then this and this and this. And blah, 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 blah. I'm just like, okay, here we go. And the Lord put us on that path and really set us in and uh, got us out here. And so the rest, they say, is history. We'll tell the rest of the story another time. But this passage in Revelation 3 was the passage that God got me to open my heart and door to be willing to come to Australia and minister to here and to see what God would do, to hear his voice and to come here and do what he said. So let's go to the last slide. We just want to remind us from these two verses, just by simply looking at the qualities of Yeshua, he is exactly who we need. He is everything that we need. Yeshua is the door. He is the one. He is the one that we need. We sometimes, we sometimes put our faith in a politician or having the right party in government or, or we put our faith in the doctors or a vaccine or, or some other medicine that might save us. And look, I don't have any problem against politicians and governments and medicines and vaccines. I don't. But he, Yeshua, is the one that we need. He's everything that we need. Our lives are in his hands. He's the one who holds the key, the door. We are in his hand. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one that will protect us that will carry us, and that will take us through whatever we will experience in 2021. 2020 has been a rough ride. But if I read the rest of Revelation, it's just the beginning of birth pangs. I hate to break it to you, but if you read Revelation and we'll get there, one third of the population dies. <laughs> you realize that's like three billion people. Maybe four by that time. But I want to finally say that Yeshua is enough. He is enough. I, I think sometimes we think we need more. Saying, God, I need more. I need more than that. No, we need Him. We need Him. He is life. He is the Holy One. He is the faithful and true One. He is enough for us. Abba Father, I just ask, Lord, we just ask for more of you in this 2021. Lord, we just want more of your spirit, more of your presence, your manifest presence here. We want more of you, Yeshua, speaking into our hearts. Lord, we want more of you. Lord, let us reflect your glory Lord, let us be filled with boldness. Let us be filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord, so that we might be bold and do the things that you have called us to do. In Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you all. So good to see everybody. Um, I, I, mean, I know that we only covered two verses and a couple of chapters, as it, as it turns out. But are there any questions or, or thoughts or Things that are going, yes, Christian. Yeah. Um, when the uh, Abraham, oh, Abraham, Abraham, yes. and um, the three guys, the three guys, he is called Lord. Yes. And is that the, also the angel of Ah, great. So Genesis chapter 18, or is it 19? It might be 18 and 19, is one of, one of the first and greatest passages to talk about the pre-incarnate Yeshua. It absolutely is. Now, the rabbis will say that it was just simply three angels. They'll say that, um, they'll even give them names, and they say that they were there to heal Abraham from his circumcision, which happens in Genesis 17. But Genesis 18, he's at the trees of memory, and three people show up. Three, it says three men show up, okay? Now, in, Gen in Genesis chapter 19, two of those men make their way down to Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot, okay? What about the third? 
But he sticks around and has this really long conversation with Abraham, and Abraham calls him Adonai. yod heh vav yod heh vav is the holy name of Adonai, Yahweh. It is the name of the Lord God Almighty. Now, wait a second. How can you call a man God? Isn't that, doesn't that, isn't that messed up? Look, there's a great, I, I can give you a book on this. Um, this. This is so deep. We did a teaching on it. It is on our website about the oneness of Adonai, the oneness of God, and who is Yeshua. And this passage here in the Hebrew, uh, Dr. Michael Brown does an entire chapter, in uh, a couple chapters in his book, Answering Jewish Objection, Objections to Jesus, and uh, talks about this uh, in depth. But absolutely, this is a picture of the pre-incarnate Yeshua. The man, when it is God in the flesh, every time it is God in the flesh, it is the person we now know as Yeshua. He wasn't called Yeshua back then because obviously, he, you know, Yeshua is the only person who decided when he was going to be born and, and, you know, and decided what name he was going to have and who his parents were going to be. None of us got that decision, but he got to make that decision. So, um, but yes, that was a pre-incarnate Yeshua and then two angels. So, absolutely. Yes. Ah, Hagar, a couple chapters later, is it? Or is it a couple chapters before? Um, I think it's a couple chapters before. That's a good question. See, this is, the, this is the question. When we're dealing with angels, sometimes it's just regular angels. We say regular, you know, messengers from the Lord. An angel is a messenger from the Lord. And other times it is the angel of the Lord. Um, I don't know. I'm, I haven't read up on that one. I don't know. It'd be, good to, it'd be good to research. Just look, sometimes it is just an angel, just a messenger, a regular messenger, because there are regular messengers. We know this. We know about Michael. We know about Gabriel. So we know that there's other angels. We know that there's a host of angels singing at Yeshua's birth. So we know this to be, to be sure. And they are flames of fire. They are spirits. They are God's messengers. That's fine. But there are times when, when Adonai decides to show up in physical form. Sure. You want to come up so people can hear? Here, I'll, Jonathan, I'll turn this one on. I'm John, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> um, last year, went to America with a whole family of 15 people. Anyway, it was a real blessed trip, and God is blessed the whole time. Angels with us the whole time went over the way, way back. But I went to San Francisco, and my son's into skate parking. The only thing is where the skate park was, was the most serious place part of the city. We come to the city hall, we got off the bus, we, had, we felt angels already with us, about two probably either side of us, we felt that, but as straight away we felt more angels. And I ever said to my son, I said, we just picked up warrior angels. I actually felt them literally, mm -hmm. like we had angels like this far from us, like we were here, those angels from here across, angels across here. We walked into the skate park and it was seedy. It was very seedy. It was very, whoa, what have we walked into here? And then we had police going around us all the time. We had one guy walk into the skate park behind us. And I said to his son, just be careful here. I think some just turned up. Just watch what we do right now. Watch our bags. Watch us. Next thing he walked out, went away. And, just, and as soon as we come away from the skate park, Come back to the city hall, only about probably five blocks back. I felt him go. But we felt the other angels still with us. There's still at least two with us the whole time. We we're in America the whole time. Mm -hmm. And we went, we had the angels, the warrior angel went, he was big, like he was, I could sense him. And I can sense him on this side, both sides. It's just so amazing how the angels are always around. Amen. And God does, he, he protects us with angelic hosts. Uh, he can communicate to us, you can read through Daniel and see different ways. Um, you know, I was, God delivered me from a fear of darkness uh, by seeing the angel that was watching over me. I, and again, I, I can't say that I saw it with physical eyes. I, I definitely sensed it. It, it this, you know, the movie, the sixth sense, but, um, 
but saw, sensed the angel that was right there. And I tell you, I wasn't afraid of the dark from that point on. So yes, uh, you know, the Lord watches over us uh, and with, with angels. But then there's this, what, there's this interesting character, which is the angel of the Lord, which is, seems to take on more worship than an angel should. And uh, so it's interesting. You'll just have to, you have to read through it. And angels don't receive worship uh, unless they're the bad angels, the bad, which we call demons, of course, uh, the rebellious ones. All right. Uh, any other questions? I know talking of angels is an interesting topic, uh, but look, I do absolutely, you know, angels exist. We see, you know, God, God created them. They are created beings. Uh, we are not to worship them. Uh, we are to test them uh, to determine whether or not they are from God. So let's, let's be clear on this. The majority of cults start because an angel shows up and demands worship. So Mormonism, you know, the angel Moroni, uh, there's a variety. Oh, Islam, I can't forget Islam, uh, starts up by, by Muhammad talking to someone he calls Gabriel, but at first called a demon or a jinn. So, um, yeah, by the way, genie. Yeah, jinn, that's the name demon. Just so you know, just giving you a little heads up. But that being said, yeah, these, all these cults uh, started by going, talking to an angel and that angel demanding worship and demanding that you go against the Lord God Almighty. Let me just remind you that there are good angels and there are bad angels and, and we, are, we are called to test them uh, according to the word of God. Um, but they are incredible. You know, God's angels are incredible. Um, they are uh, wonderful protection, and um, absolutely. And I, how many have had a, a, an angelic experience? Either have seen an angel or had an experience where you have felt an angelic. Yeah, so there's a huge majority in here. Um, and so yes, we we work and live. Yes, we we as human humankinds are made for the physical world, but we are both physical and spiritual. We are we we can't separate the two. Right, but angelic beings are only uh, only spiritual, but sometimes are manifest in the physical realm. Okay, so that's regular angels. I'm talking about the angel of the Lord as a little separate. We can have a much deeper conversation about that. That's a because talking of the nature of Adonai is is really a talking is a discussion about how has God chosen to reveal Himself throughout history. That's really what it is. When we talk about God and it's a question of, okay, these authors, whether it's Abraham or Moses, you know, Moses writing the stories of Abraham, they write this story. Moses in the burning bush is another great example. He sees the bush burning. He knows something's wrong because it's not being consumed. He sees the angel of the Lord standing in the bush and he hears a voice all at the same time. And he doesn't call them three. He addresses them as singular Adonai, the Lord God Almighty. So we look at that and we say, well, well, is it the angel? Is it the voice? Is it the fire? I mean, well, the author doesn't make a distinction. And that's what you'll see in scriptures, that the author's simply trying to write what he saw and experienced. And that's where we see this is how God has chosen to reveal himself. Uh, So... God chooses to reveal, has chosen to reveal himself most fully in the person of Yeshua, our Messiah, right? So this is actually a very Jewish concept. Uh, I know that um, there are many who say there's not, but it, long before, uh, even back when the Septuagint was writ- written, these, these things were discussed. So 200 years before Yeshua, the question of would the Messiah be a divine Messiah was very much asked because of other passages that we'll get into probably later. But for more on that, please see Dr. Michael Brown's website, uh, realmessiah.com. He has the entire uh, description on Genesis chapter 19. You can just go to, uh, what is it? Ask Dr. Brown, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org or realmessiah.com. So there's links to those on our website. So you can go under the links and go there. But if you go to those two places, you can specifically type in Genesis chapter 19, who was the third man. And he has a much more in-depth 
uh, understanding of the Hebrew scriptures and what that's all about. Okay? That's it. I know. Let's all stand together. We'll, we'll uh, do the Aharonic benediction. When the Lord uh, spoke to Aaron, he says, when you bless the people, put my name on them. Bless them with my name. We are blessed in his name. The Lord be with you. Uh, I learned something new. When we say goodbye, the etymology of goodbye is God be with you. That's what it came from. God be with you. So when you say goodbye, uh, when an atheist tells you goodbye, you just say, and to you also, may God be with you. So there you go. That's what we're saying is that the Lord wants to put his name on us. And Yeshua actually promises that later on in, the, in this congregation in, uh, to the, um, that we'll, we'll study next week. All right. Yibarecha Kadonai Vaishmarecha Yahe Adonai Panavalecha Vechunecha Isa Adonai Panavalecha Vesmecha Shalom The Shem Yeshua Hamashiach Amen May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, blessings on all of you. We will see you next week.